Welcome to the Grueling Truths NFL Legends Show, brought to you by GridArmo, a new interactive football app. Make sure you check out GridArmo at www.gridarmo.com. As always, for the NFL Legends Show, I'm your host, Mike Goodpaster. We have a very special guest today. Um, our guest was the first African-American starting quarterback in pro football history, won two Super Bowls with the Miami Dolphins. Please help me welcome to the Grueling Truth, Marlon Briscoe. How you doing? All right. It's an absolute honor yeah. to have you on, sir. Well, it's an honor to be here. Thanks for inviting me. Well, let's just start off. Tell us a little bit about your childhood, and especially the part about the magic box your uncle gave you <laughs> when you were a little boy. I know I read that, and that was a cool story. Well, I grew up in uh, the projects uh, uh, in uh, Omaha, Nebraska, and, uh, you know, I, I didn't really uh, take the sports at at one time, but uh, I used to have this bully that used to chase me home. And uh, it's not that I was afraid of him. I just didn't like to fight. But anyway, yeah. so uh, my cousin, Bob Rose, who tutored Gail Sayers, he, he, he tutored Johnny Rogers, he had Ron Boone, who played for the Lakers, uh, when we were kids. And, uh, you know, he was very intermittent instrumental as a mentor for a lot of kids that went on to do great things uh, in their adult uh, in, in their adulthood in terms of professional sports well he uh, my mom told him that uh, this bully was chasing me and I wouldn't fight so he came over to the house one day and he said tomorrow I'm going to be back and I'm going to bring you something, and you'll never run from this bully again. So the next day, he comes over with this big box full of old, dusty baseball gloves, football, soccer, uh, you know, the works of, of sports, because he was a, uh, uh, a teacher at a local yeah. uh, school you know, across town. But anyway, so he started off with baseball, and then the basketball, and then uh, he, he taught me uh, how to throw a football, and I became in love with that football. And um, you know, that's how it all started. Now, how old were you when you started playing organized sports? Or organized uh, football? Ten, I was, yeah, I was ten years old, um, and signed up for the Pop Warner League. Uh, so when I went to try out, uh, Simon A. Simon, who was the coach, and he was a very fair individual, uh, and there were only like three blacks on our team at the time, and so he said, okay, defensive backs over here, wide receivers over here, uh, uh, running backs are uh, over here, and he said, uh, uh, so I, I, I stepped into the quarterback line, and he said, son, don't you want to over to uh, the uh, running back line or the defensive back line. I said, no, sir. I wanted to uh, go on the quarterback line. So he didn't, he didn't actually dissuade me from, uh, from going there. He said, okay, let's go. Let's start practice. Now, and, now real quick, at that age, did you kind of sense why they were asking you to go to another line? I mean, was it kind of explained to you beforehand by anybody? Yeah, it was it was explained to me by uh, beforehand. Uh, one thing that happened was there, you know, uh, kids from my neighborhood or mentors from my neighborhood, excuse me, who went to the practice to see if I got a fair to make sure I got a fair shake. Yeah, uh, you know they we play uh, tackle football uh, in my neighborhood and the. Older guys would always let me, let me play quarterback because I I was the only one that could throw the football and they were all yeah. older than me. So, but uh, they 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 went to the practice not to stir up any you know problems or anything of that nature, but just to see if I would get a fair shape because they knew that uh, or they thought that you know I wanted an opportunity to uh, play that position at that age. Yeah, and tell us a little bit about your high school career and what led you to eventually play your college football at the University of Omaha. Well, I, I, I uh, throughout my uh, high school football days, 
I shared the job with a kid named Joe Barinas, and he would go in. Uh, he was a classic black uh, uh, drop back quarterback, and I used to move around even at that age. And uh, so we, you know, we switched off and on uh, the duties of the quarterback in high school. But my senior year, um, the uh, they needed a running back, so the uh, coach switch asked me would I switch to running back, and I said, well, yeah, I'll, I'll, I'll do that. And uh, you know, I switched to running back for my senior year, and I ironically made all city at running back. I didn't play quarterback my senior year, and so, but. Uh, we played in an uh, all-star game, which was the best seniors in the state. And we, uh, the quarterback got hurt on my team, and so I had to play quarterback instead of running back. And we beat the heavily favored uh, North team, which was our opposition. And uh, two weeks later, we ended up. I ended up playing in a basketball summer league classic against two All-Americans, and we beat them, and I, I was the most valuable player. So within two weeks, you know, I had uh, did a, fair, a pretty good job of, of spearheading the uh, the two sports classics that were very, very uh, valuable to uh, college coaches back, in, back at that time. Um, so afterwards, I, you know, waited for the scholarships to come, and they didn't come. And the reason why they didn't come is because, you know, I wanted to play quarterback, and they knew that. And so they wanted to switch me at another position. And that was something that, uh, you know, I, I really didn't want to do. So the late Al Coniglia, who was uh, the coach at uh, Omaha University at the time, uh, it's now University of Nebraska, Omaha. He came to my house to recruit me, and he said, I'll give you two things. I'll give you a, a diploma. I'll get you your diploma, and you'll play quarterback. And that that was enough for me. And that's how yeah, it started. So you, yeah, so you want to talk a little bit about your college career, any highlights, anything you remember? Well, you know, I had a, a lot of highlights, but uh, – one of the main things I remember is when we were playing Morningside College at uh, at the stadium uh, where they played the College World Series, and uh, you know we were way behind, and so we had a rally, and I was just throwing the ball all over the place, and we, you know, um, uh, receptions, reception wise, and we ended up winning an improbable win. Uh, over Morningside. As a matter of fact, I went to my uh, college fraternity uh, party after the game, and everybody said, "Hey, man, we we saw that we saw that you lost." I said, we didn't leave because people left the, left the stadium. <laughs> uh, they had left the stadium uh, before the game was over, and they thought we had lost. It was, it was an improbable uh, win, um, but uh, that was one of the. Highlights of my uh, college uh, college days, as far as uh, a player was concerned. But we we had uh, some good players on my college team. Jerry Allen, who was drafted by the Redskins, and uh, he was drafted by the Baltimore Colts, ended up playing for the Redskins. Uh, we had quite a few players uh, for a school of our size that got a shot at the NFL. All right, so in 1968, you were drafted by the Broncos in the 14th round. When you were drafted, you, you were drafted as a defensive back. What were your feelings about being drafted as a defensive back instead of a quarterback? Well, you know, when they came to recruit me, uh, uh, they actually came to see Jerry Allen. and But uh, Stan Jones, who was a, a member of the uh, Monsters of the Midway of the old Chicago Bears, he was the head he was a scout that would come to scout our kids at uh, at our college, and uh, he asked Al Coniglia, 
you said, well, who's that little guy throwing the ball down there? And, you know, Al, you know, told him what it was. And he, he became um, somebody who took an interest in me as a quarterback. And he was Denver's uh, top scout at the time. And so he, he was uh, partly responsible for me getting drafted, even though it was in the 14th round. And Denver needed the defensive corners at the time. So they told me that uh, they would draft me as a cornerback, and uh, which they did. And then uh, when the Fred Gerke came to uh, talk to me about it, I told him, I said, I'll play corner, but you have to give me a three-day trial at quarterback. And the late Al Coniglia, he had, told me that Denver was one of the only teams in the NFL that held their practices in Denver uh, in front of the media, the media and the fans. So with this, uh, my motive for asking for this three-day trial was to get an opportunity uh, for a form of my ability. And, uh, you know, if it hadn't been for that three-day trial, I, I never would have gotten to play quarterback because I did real well in a three-day trial, and there were like uh, eight quarterbacks uh, in camp that that uh, week. It was a, a weekend camp, and um, the the media started saying, "Well, who's this kid from Omaha?" Uh, Stan Jones knew who I was, and he and he knew I could play, and so did Denver actually. But uh, uh, actually, you know. Go ahead. Sorry about that. No, no, no. Go ahead. Well, your first game experience actually came in the season opener, the last 10 minutes of the opening game. Can you describe what that was like? Well, you know, I didn't think I was going to play. Uh, what happened was, uh, just to uh, back back the reel up a little bit, um, you know, after the, uh, I had gotten hurt, I had uh, tore a hamstring and so I was out and in the meantime Steve Tinsley broke a collarbone and you know he was out for a few games so they used two of the uh, quarterbacks that were in that camp that I was in and they didn't fare well Uh, as a matter of fact uh, the offense didn't score any points going into the um, latter part of training camp and the first couple of games into the season. So, you know, in Denver, when they when they would cut you, they would take your, your, uh, your uniform out of your locker. Yeah. So I went to my locker, and I opened it up, and there was this number 15 in my locker. So I automatically thought I was cut um, because I knew that they needed a quarterback because uh, – the offense wasn't faring well. And I turned around, and there was Lou Saban, and he said, my friend, you see that number 15 in your locker? I said, yes, sir. He said, that's yours. You're now a quarterback. And you're talking about somebody that healed instantly. Um, so uh, that's how uh, the switch was made. And, uh, you know, I didn't expect to go on to the game because I only had like six or eight plays because this was on Tuesday. The game was on Sunday. Yeah. So, you know, I just figured that, you know, I was a stopgap measure in case the quarterback got hurt or whatever. And uh, so, we, you know, it was like 10 minutes or something left. We were playing the Patriots, I believe. Um, and uh, he said, Briscoe, go ahead, get ready. And I'm thinking – what in the world is this? <laughs> so, <laughs> you know, I, you know I, I didn't have a, a, a menu of plays to go in there uh, to do an effective job. I didn't have any, no cerebral preparation because uh, I, I wasn't there in training camp uh, to learn how to read defenses uh, or, you know, NFL defenses. And uh, so, but I went in anyway. And everybody was nervous except me. <laughs> you know, I had always played that position, and uh, you know, I, you know, I just 
went out there and my mindset was to just play stand like ball and play like you did in college. Yeah. Because that's all I had. That's all I had. So I remember the the only the the primary thing I wanted to do uh, in that game was to complete my first pass. And, uh, you know, we were behind, so I had to throw. And I completed my first pass with 22 yards, and and uh, we we went on down the field, and I, I think I scored on a 38-yard play. And so the crowd went wild, and, you know, the players, it was euphoric, actually. And because uh, it was a different kind of it's not a different style of ball, uh, with the quarterback running around back there and running and throwing and that kind of stuff. But uh, that's how it started. Um, that three, if I hadn't have gotten that three-day trial of quarterback, I never would have gotten the opportunity to play quarterback. Now, do you think the do you think the reason was strictly racial, or do you think a lot of it had to do with the size too, or just the two combined made it even that much more difficult? Well, probably you, you're probably right on that end. But Russell Wilson and I are the same size. So, yeah, but it's also fifty about, years later. <laughs> well, yeah. You're forty years later. But you know, I defeated the Miami Dolphins with with Bob Gibson. I mean Bob Greasy. Yeah. And Bob and I became ended up ironically became a battery, and you know, uh, nothing against Bob, but he wasn't that much taller than I was. Yeah, so, and uh, uh, I've seen the film. I don't think he was any better than you were either. Well, we beat him. That's so why that, they handed the ball off all the time. <laughs> <laughs> well, I don't want to comment on, the, comment on that. But, uh, <laughs> um, you know, um, racism uh, certainly had a lot to do with it. I mean, we're talking about 1968, 1969. Yeah, you had Fran Tarkenton running around about the same time, closer to the yeah. same size as you, and nobody well, had a problem with him well, doing it. Exactly, exactly. Uh, you know, but, but in Lou Saban's case, you know, I mean, he cut me, and then the next, the next year he cut James Harris. So uh, at, at Buffalo or, or a couple of years down the road, so he cut the first two black quarterbacks. Yeah, and James Harris was the guy that went on to have some success with the Rams, and then all of a sudden he's not the starting quarterback there, and nobody ever hears from him again. That's right. And so you have to look at the time in this country, you know, what was going on not only in football, but what was going on, you know, uh, in, every, in every endeavor uh, in black American life. And so uh, – but Lou was quirky too, you know. I mean, he did some things that uh, belied imagination in terms of handling <laughs> players, um, be they black or white. So I, I, I certainly thought wholeheartedly that racism had a lot to do with the way he handled my situation. But as I look back over the years. Uh, I, I, I'm I'm sure that racism had something to do with it, but a lot of it had to do with Lou Saban's personality and uh, the way he did things, because he did some things against white players too that <laughs> kind of was. Uh, that, that's why he coached was, almost every different. team in the United States, college and pro, before he was done. Yeah, yeah, he he even ended up in Omaha, near Omaha, uh, coaching. So he he went all over the place. Uh, now, 1968, you, know, you were the runner-up for the Rookie of the Year. Yeah, I think you set it then rookie record, 14 touchdown passes in your first season. Um, of course, you said Denver let you go. You went to Buffalo after the 68 season. Uh, Buffalo had a couple pretty good quarterbacks there. What, what was your feeling when they asked you to be a wide receiver there? Well, you know, I had never played wide receiver in my life, not even on the playgrounds, because when we were coming up, I was always a quarterback, and uh, that's all I that's all I really knew. But I did have supreme confidence in my athletic ability, you know. Um, so, you know, I asked them, uh, told them, you know, I would come and play wide receiver, uh, but you couldn't cut me in the last cut. So now I. There's two contracts I negotiated myself by giving demands 
Well, first one, I'm giving the Mavs as a 14th round draft choice uh, to get a quarterback look. And now I'm going to Buffalo with uh, the uh, uh, preseason already started. I mean, it was half training camp was half over. And so they agreed to, uh, you know, my request uh, and to cut me on the last cut if they're going to cut me. So, uh, but before, you know, I had gone to Canada for one day. And, I, you know, they had drafted me as well as, as Denver. And I, I um, they're still looking for me. It's cold up left. there, Marlon. <laughs> <laughs> so I, I made a call while I was in uh, Vancouver. I made a call to all the teams that I had had success with, and I had, beat, had beaten Buffalo twice, I believe. Um, and I had a great game against the Oakland Raiders, and, and Al Roush, uh, Jim uh, Roush was the coach at Buffalo, and he took over at at uh, Buffalo. So, you know, that's that's how I uh, negotiated my contract. And I didn't get in get in any games during the preseason. So we were down at the, the last game San, uh, San, against San Diego. And, uh, you know, I didn't – so I wasn't going to play and they were going to cut me. And all of a sudden – Ten minutes left in the game. I guess ten minutes in the waning parts of the game is is uh, my destiny or so. <laughs> so they, they let me in in, uh, in the last ten minutes, and the late Jack Kemp, he and I were roommates on the road. He 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 chose me to be his roommate, and uh, we became very close. And he said, "I'm coming at your rooms." And he just kept throwing me the ball, kept throwing me the ball, kept throwing me the ball. I ended up catching four balls in ten, you know, ten minutes, so they couldn't cut me. Yeah. And and so the next, you know, as the season progressed, you know, I uh, got better and better and better. I, I put in a lot of hard work, studied uh, Paul Warfield and Lance Allworth, two athletes that I thought, you know, mirrored my athletic ability. And, uh, you know, that's how it happened. One the one advantage I had playing quarterback, I knew where I wanted my receivers to be and, um, you know, what their role was in the game and, and uh, you know, who I could count on in critical situations. So that helped me uh, make the transition. Uh, so, it, there were, you know, the stars were all aligned. There were a lot of things that, that happened, uh, um, and uh, hard work and perseverance and never give up attitude. Uh, as I tell young people, um, uh, that's what got me through. Yeah, and now in 1972, you were traded from the Bills to the Dolphins. So what were your feelings about going to Miami from Buffalo? I mean, it had to be, number one, it's a lot warmer, and then number two, you were coming from a team that I think it was, what, 1-13? One and thirteen, but see the, the irony of all of that was uh, that year they hired Lou Sa- Buffalo hired Lou Saban as their coach. <laughs> <laughs> so you know, I said, "Oh Lord, what is the world? What's what's happening here?" Yeah, they so Lou Saban is the coach. Now he has to deal with me on a different level. I'm not this naive rookie. Uh, that thought, you know, thought everything was going to be fair. Now, you know, I was all pro. Uh, you know, I was uh, really um, uh, in the community, you know, uh, doing things in the community. I was also the player rep for the Bills. So now I'm in a different role. I think, and so <laughs> I think uh, Lou Saban traded me on the plane on the way to Buffalo. Because he didn't want to deal with me now, um, you know, because it, it was a different situation. So uh, Miami traded the number one draft choice for me uh, that year to compliment Paul Warfield. 
So I went from a 14th round draft choice to a number one draft choice uh, in that period of uh, period of my career. Yeah, and I think the guy they got for you ended up in the Hall of Fame also, wasn't that Joe DeLamalier? Joe Joey D. We always talk about it every time I say it. Either he'll mention it or, or I'll mention it. But well, he got to go to the Hall of Fame. You got to go to a couple Super Bowls. <laughs> yeah, that's what he said. <laughs> so, you know, with Joe D and I, we, we tease each other and, uh, about that every time we see each other. Now, you were on a 1-13 and team in Buffalo. You go to Miami. They go down as the only undefeated team ever at 17-0. and um, You played for the legendary Don Shula. How did Shula keep that team from having a letdown during that season? Well, you see, first of all, you know, Coach Shula uh, is the greatest coach in my mind in the history of the game. Um, and uh, he had some of the best assistant coaches uh, in the league, Bill Lawrence Barger, Howard Schnellenberger, uh, Monty Clark. And he let those guys coach. You know, I mean, everybody knew who was in charge. But he let those guys coach because several of them went on to be head coaches. On yeah, their and they own. were all pretty successful when they were. And out. they were all pretty successful. And uh, that was, I think that was a, a tribute to the way – Coach Shula, you know, handled that. You know, some some coaches, uh, you know, they want to be the all the end all uh, 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 decision maker, and uh, but Coach Shula let those guys coach, and we know who was the position coach, but we also know who was the coach. But it all uh, tied in, you know, to harmony. And, uh, you know, uh, that was the way Coach Shula handled his staff and handled the players as well. All right. Now, you went on to play for a couple other teams. So you played for the Lions, a couple other teams. You retired after the 1976 season, became, what, a broker? I think is what I read. Yeah, I was, so, yeah, yeah, I was a broker up in uh, San Francisco. I mean, now, I mean, I know a lot of people probably already know the story of what happened after you retired, but why do you think it was so hard for you to adjust to life without football? Well, it, uh, I had, uh, I th- you know, a- as I think back on it now, uh, it could have been a residual effect from the fact that they wouldn't let me play quarterback, quarterback after um, you know, I had what I think was a great season for what I, yeah. you know, for what I had to work with. And I think, uh, I think it was something that was in the back of my mind, not something, you know, that was outwardly, uh, expressed, but, uh, you know, look at, uh, Three out of the four quarterbacks, black quarterbacks that um, had you know had the skills to play me, Elders Dickey, and uh, Joe Gilliam. You know we all succumbed to you know the drug culture of the seventies and eighties. James Harris, uh, he had a different uh, mindset. He, he James was you know he uh, was tutored by uh, the late Eddie Robinson. Um, you know, James had a, you know, he was just a, a, a no-nonsense type of guy, uh, unless he was telling his jokes. But, uh, <laughs> you know, subconsciously, um, that uh, could have been a trigger that, uh you know, put me in in, in that arena. Um, yeah. yeah, so uh, it wasn't something that I thought about at that time, but as I look back on uh, those uh, terrible times, um, you know, I think maybe it could have crept in my mind uh, that uh, that was a catalyst for me acting the way I did back in those days. 
Now, I know, I, you you know. Pre- I know you went to prison for a little while, got out in 1990. What was the moment, whether it was in prison before or after, where you just said, I've got to change things? Well, you know, uh, I was watching the Super Bowl with Doug Williams playing uh, in 88 because I had uh, had two different stints, you know, in jail. And and I remember how emotional I got uh, watching him play and, you know, watching him win and feeling that I had a, a lot to do with him uh, being able to play that position, because if I had a failed in, in, in 1968, James Harris would not have gotten drafted uh, as a quarterback. It had been a tight end or whatever. But I think I was a litmus test uh, uh, to see if a black man could think, throw, and lead on that level. Yeah. And, uh, you know, so that affected me. And when I... Uh, was in uh, jail for uh, down in San Diego. Um, you know, I, I had a, a, a real reflection, you know, of my life and the success, um, except the uh, success and the you know the, so and the failure that uh, I succumbed to. I just said to myself, "No mas." And, uh, you know, after I was released, you know, I said, this is it. So I had a friend of mine drive all the way from L.A., came and picked me up uh, to take me back to L.A. But, <laughs> you know, the, the uh, you know, I was when I was released, you know, I was still uh, an addict. Um, and, you know, I only... It was only 60 days that I was in in jail, but it was enough for me to change my mind about my lifestyle. And so, um, he, my friend Julius, he came uh, came down from L.A., picked me up, and drove. We drove back to uh, to L.A. and I started teaching school, and you know, I put the drugs down and uh, went on with my life on a more positive note. All right, so kind of tell us what you've been doing since then. I know you worked at a Boys and Girls Club. Yeah, I was a director of Boys and Girls Club in Long Beach. I started off uh, in Watts with the Boys and Girls Club there. I uh, helped build a, a brand-new club. I was a assistant project manager cause, because I studied, studied three years of engineering my first three years in college. Yeah. Uh, um, I had to give that up when I fractured my neck, and uh, my, which would have been my senior year. And they said I would never play football again. So, you know, I've gone through, a, you know, a lot of ups and downs and twists and turns. And, um, but somehow, you know, uh, with the help of God and, and uh, you know, people that I grew up with and I guess my own will, um you know, I was able to make make good over some ominous situations in, in, in parts of my life. Yeah, I, I mean, your story is amazing. I mean, especially the way you always battle back. And I know there's a movie that's getting ready to be made about your life. You want to tell us how that came about and what part of the process the movie's in right now? Well, uh, how it started, I wrote a book called The First Black Quarterback, and some people read the book, and they liked it. So a friend of mine, John Beasley, actually we played together in college. He was my guard, and he's an acclaimed actor. I don't know if you've seen Soul Man. With, he plays Cedric the Entertainer's uh, father Yeah. Uh, in that segment. He was in Apocalypse now. Uh, um, not Apocalypse. Uh, he was in a movie uh uh, and, and he's done several things uh, in that industry. And he he suggested that he uh, make a movie as an adaptation of my book, and that's how I started. Uh, I got the ball rolling, and there was a lot of interest. 
uh, particularly from my my community in Omaha, and they uh, started the support system, and uh, we went from there, and it seems like it's going to be a uh, uh, reality now uh, that we've come so far. Well, definitely when you're ready to release that, we need to have you back on to plug that a little bit, because I definitely want to see it. I think it'll be a great movie. Um, my other question is this. You brought up Doug Williams and how you felt when you watched him. How do you feel today when you watch Cam Newton or Russell Wilson, all these quarterbacks are successful, and you were the first one? Well, you know, I met Cam Newton when he was 15. Uh, Warren Moon, Doug Williams, James Harris, and I, we had a foundation called the Field Generals. And what we would do, we would go to every Super Bowl city and put on camps for young you know, for young kids uh, yeah. uh, each year. And uh, we had a skills camp this year, that year, I'm sorry, where the, the targets were moving, the, the same type of uh, show that they used to have on TV. Oh, the, uh, uh, the, the old NFL quarterback challenge, I think it was? Yeah, yeah, yeah. So we had one of those. And he was this kid, he was like lightening it up. And he's a big kid. You know, and our age group was from 6 to 17, and he looked like he was bigger than 17. So I asked Warren, I said, Who was that kid? Oh, he's that kid throwing on over there. And Warren said, I don't know, but he's, he's, he's darn good. So I walked over to him at, at a recess period, and I said, Hey, son, uh, what's your name? He said, uh, Cam Newton, sir. I said, well, how old are you? He said, uh, I'm 15. <laughs> I said, well, listen, you got a great future ahead of you. I said, don't let it slip away. Um, I, I, uh, I introduced myself. Well, I introduced myself first. And uh, he was a man among boys then. So, and, of course, Russell Wilson and I played the exact same style. And... Yeah. Uh, you know, with him being so-called diminutive, uh, like they called me, I think he just, you know, um, you know, let it be known that the, it's not the size of the ship, it's the motion of the ocean. If you can play, you can play. Yeah, if you can play, you can play. Yeah. And, and I mean, I, I've met Drew Brees before, and Drew Brees isn't much taller than five foot ten, so... Well, you know, and, and another thing, you, James, I mean, uh, uh, all, all plethora of black quarterbacks in the league, uh, they've given me kudos as to starting the ball on, on in that realm, in that light, I'm sorry. And, uh, you know, uh, those guys, Cam Newton, Russell Wilson, the kid from uh, Minnesota. Yeah, Teddy Bridgewater. No, no, no. British, Bridgewater. I met him, too. He's a great kid. I couldn't remember his name. But if they were playing in 68, none of them would be playing quarterback. That, that's uh, And that's the god-awful uh, God truth. As great a player as they are today, uh, if they were playing in 68, Cam Newton would be a tight end. Uh, Russell Wilson be, would be a defensive back, or or something of that nature. And that's that's a sad reality, but that's just the way it is. Yeah, and what you said is proven just by you were like the runner-up for rookie of the year, and you still had to change positions. You get a guy like James Harris, who I'm always big on. James Harris was a hell of a quarterback, and I think yeah. James didn't he start off with Buffalo when you were there? Yeah, we were roommates. Okay, I, I thought that was near yeah. he got drafted. Yeah, he, we we ended up ironically uh, roommates. Sadly, however, I had to tell him, you know, the realities of what was going to happen to him. Um, you know, '68 and '69 was only one year apart, and uh, sure enough, you know, he was treated, you know, um, basically the same, you know, the same way. Uh, yeah. Then he goes to L.A., gets him to the championship game in 74, and then they replace him again. Yeah, they replaced him with, I think it was Pat Hayden or Jaworski or somebody. Like yeah, that. it was one of the two, and neither yeah, one of them were. But, but, you know, it, it's, um, 
the difference between me and James is that he openly received death threats. Now, you know, I'm be, my, me being his roommate, I saw those. Uh, I saw those death threats. You know, he was showing them to me, and I often wondered, you know, if our quarterback the year before him, why I never got death threats. Yeah. Just recently, I ran into uh, my receiver Eric Crabtree, who uh, ironically or incidentally he he caught my first pass that twenty two yarder. Yeah. So he's living here in the area now, and he and he <laughs> he told me that the reason why I didn't get death threats is because he went in my mail, and because he was a veteran, he went in my mail and took out all the death threat mail. And uh, so I would never see it. <laughs> so I just found that out this year. Yeah. All right, so how do you think? So I know you met Cam Newton when he was younger, but I know he's catching a lot of flack the Super Bowl, the ball he didn't dive on, the way he acted after the press conference. Um, do you think he'll have any problem coming back from that? Well, no, I, I, I didn't hear the uh, his press conference after the game. Yeah, that's the one where he basically didn't say much, and then he just walked off, which I think this. You just lost the Super Bowl. Nobody knows how they're going to react to that. Right. Uh, you know, I know he's a, a very humble kid. Uh, I, I, In fact, I met him uh, as, he, as a pro uh, down in uh, Las Vegas. So he remembers the encounter we had. Uh, he, you know, he's very respectful. Uh, you know, he's become animated, uh, you know, uh, when he makes good plays or whatever. Uh, but it, 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 it juices up his team, uh, his you know, his teammates. And so uh, he's just doing what he does, being himself, um, to lead his team. And he does a great job. He he uh, threatened our uh, Dolphin record, and so uh, that was very difficult to do because it's so hard to run the table. Uh, now, are, are you one of the guys that sits down there and drinks the champagne when the last team loses? I am. <laughs> <laughs> See, I always had everybody say, "Well, isn't that kind of greedy or something?" You know, but my point is this: if you're trying to break, if you get a personal record and you're like that, I think that's kind of being kind of a I don't know what's the good word for it, but kind of a ass or whatever. But I think as a team accomplishment, I think it means even more. I, my sentiments exactly. See, uh, you know, individual records are almost made to be broken. I don't. Yeah. I don't care. You know, I don't care uh, how to cite the records might seem, um, but they're, they're made to be broken. Uh, we as a team, uh, and and that's what we were—a team. You know, it wasn't, you know, it wasn't a one-man show on, on our team. Uh, you know, if we had to throw, we could throw. If we, you know, had to run the ball, we had 2,000-yard rushers, and then you had Jim Kick coming in uh, on third down. Uh, we had, we just had a. A bevy of yeah, you're loaded. You had you and yeah, Paul Warfield, a wide receiver. Yeah, and how he had one of the great it. offensive lines of all time. A great defense. Yeah, but you know, to be you know, uh, I think like four guys on our offensive line were cut from other teams. Yeah. So Shula, you know, he had an eye for talent, not not conditions. Or not predicaments that these players went through. He knew that yeah. they could play, and uh, you know, other teams wish they could have had those players that you know they uh, they cast off. Um, wish they could have them back, but they were ours, and, and you know, we were a great fit, and we are, we had this um, saying that the winning edge. And the winning edge was that we were in better condition. We were more intelligent. Uh, we were mis- as far as close to being mistake-free as you can be in a football game. And we were lucky. 
Because there was a couple of games we could have lost. But yeah, I mean the playoff uh, games, you had. I mean, you were behind Pittsburgh, weren't you? In Pittsburgh. Yeah, we were behind Pittsburgh, and uh, you know we had to punt the ball, and time was running out. So Larry Seibel went back to punt, and all of a sudden he took off. He took off running. He did it on his own. Nobody on the team knew, even Coach Shula, because I was standing next to him. Uh, and he said, Shula. I mean, he said, Sype, Sype, what you doing? Go, go, go. <laughs> and so, uh, you know, Sype made it. We, girl kicked the field goal, and we, we won the game. So Yeah, and you, you guys were undefeated, and you were the underdogs in the Super Bowl. Yeah, yeah, yeah. But, uh, you know, the Pittsburgh Steelers had more publicity than we did, you know. Uh, yeah. And so, you know, we were undefeated and, and the underdogs, but we never knew we were the underdog. And that's the, that was the nature of the psyche of uh, of our team. We yeah. just we knew we were the best, regardless. And we went out to prove it, and we played like it. Well, I, I can tell you this: it's an absolute honor having you on the show tonight. Um, do you do you want to give anybody some website information to check out on your movie or any other organizations you're with? Yeah, it's MarlonBriscoeMovie dot com. Okay, but once again, absolute honor to have you, Marlon. Well, thank you for having me. I appreciate it. Like the like the conversation. Yep, same here. So, anytime you want to come back, if you if you know if you still talk to James Harris, I'd love to have him on. Oh yeah, I talk to uh, to James uh, quite frequently. All right. Well, thanks for coming on again. I want to tell everybody to make sure you check us out on iTunes and Spreaker. Go to like the Grueling Truth Facebook page. Next week, our guests include former Kansas City wide receiver J.J. Burden, um, former NFL coach, one of the great offensive line coaches of all time. Jen, Jim Hannafin will be on with us Tuesday. Um, Wednesday, we got another great offensive line coach, Jim McNally, who was with the Bengals Giants. Um, also, we'll have former Bengals right tackle Bruce Reimers on, so make sure you check out all those shows. So, for Marlon Briscoe, I'm Mike Goodpaster. You've been listening to The Grueling Truth, where the legends speak. Okay, Mike, thank you.